All right, welcome back. As you can see there from the screen, Tosifani Rodadea, MD and Devil Nigeria, Samuel Okwada, co-founder and CEO at Remedial Health. Both are joining me right now from Lagos. Hello, Tosi. Good to see you. Uh, I guess we'll start this with a very good smile to encourage us this morning. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you both. Hello, Samuel. How are you guys doing? Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for having me on. Hi, hi. Where should we start hi, from? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes. I guess we should start from the, the elephant in the room. Is it an elephant now? Perhaps it's a bird. It's a bird, a big bird. Perhaps like the eagle, Twitter, the ban lifted, or according to the government, suspension, restriction lifted. How did you guys feel? Uh, that news came out uh, late yesterday. Um, are, you all, are you back now? on Twitter, or you were not even away in the first place. <laughs> so I'm um, happy to go first. I was never away, um, but I was really happy to to read the news that the ban was going to be lifted at, at 12 a.m. Um, I think, you know, pretty much people are getting their voices back. And Twitter is so important for our market, for our nation. It allows young people create, it allows young people engage, it allows people to sell allows people to express themselves and i'm so happy now that people can tweet without vpn mm, without vpn samuel what's your own view were, were you away or you weren't away just like uh tosa said um so i, I would say um in nigerian palace we thank god though. Um, <laughs> it's been a long time um there have been talks about it for a while coming back uh, so we're glad that it's finally back. Um, as Tosin said as well, um, the world is a global village, yeah? And apart from tweeting, people also work on Twitter, people mm -hmm. also sell on Twitter. And um, that ban definitely slowed things down. I wouldn't say it stopped us, uh, myself included, but yes, um, definitely affected business. Mm. Okay, Samuel, let me stick with you a bit. H how did it affect your business and how do you think it affected startups or even scale ups? Just will be discussed as we'll be discussing in a bit. H how, how did it affect you and how do you think it has affected businesses and the return right now of Nigeria Twitter? Because a lot of us were tweeting from different places Netherlands, UK, France, US, uh, and all of that while you were still domiciled in Nigeria. Yes, yes. So um, using my business as an example, I wouldn't say it affected my business, but it definitely affected my ability to reach out to, for example, um, other founders in other countries that I felt maybe were in the same shoes as I was, and I needed some advice. Um, I have gotten an investment off Twitter. So I am an investor connected, we talked, and he was happy with the business and he invested a small check, but that is the power of Twitter. And mm -hmm. when you're not able to do that freely, um, definitely slows things down. Now for other businesses, for example, in the past, I have purchased um, shoes from Twitter. I've purchased food from Twitter. These businesses are selling their products on Twitter and the ban definitely slowed them down. Um, again, I say it didn't stop them. We're resilient people, especially the young people of Nigeria. Um, but yes, definitely slowed it down. Okay, then. Um, okay, uh, Tosi, do you have anything to say concerning that? On how perhaps you think uh, the, the restriction on Twitter that we've seen in the last over 200 days um, impacted businesses? Because I know at least for you that is that is a chief executive, you, you interact daily with entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. startups and all of that. What, what were the kind of echoes or the things that you were being told at least in the last several months? I think, I think the biggest one would be reach. And I don't know if any analysis has been done, but I think it would be interesting to see the engagement on Twitter before the ban and after the ban. I think it's also important to recognize that not everyone is able to afford VPN as cheap as some people think it might be. And so that definitely affected reach. I think also companies were on the fence. Companies were not sure if they should tweet, knowing that there was a ban and if they'll be in trouble with the law. 
And so you had a lot of individuals tweeting, but then com their company is not really tweeting. So I think that also affected the reach of people that they would have done business with, for instance, just like how Samuel um, had earlier pointed. Okay. Now let's talk about the startup uh, policy that the government is proposing. And Tosi, let me still stick with you. Is it good news? Uh, because it seems to, to uh, okay, the initiative is from government as well as perhaps leading tech uh, experts. How did you take this news wh when you saw that? And don't forget that this startup uh, uh, policy, Nigeria startup bill rather, would replace the investment and the startup uh, policy. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Um, so first of all, I should actually say that I don't know much about the investment policy, the national investment policy that we had before. Um, for startups, I don't know if it was implemented and I don't know any beneficiaries. However, I do think that the Nigerian startup bill is very important for us. It's very important because we need to create an enabling environment for these startups to thrive. And we've come to see the power of startups. I mean, if you just think about last year and how um, difficult last year was for a lot of businesses, when you think about the funding that came into Nigeria for startups, we raised, startup companies raised over $1.5 billion. And so that just shows you the power of startups and what they can do. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have the same goal, startups, regulators, and everyone, job creation, wealth creation, and overall prosperity. And I think the government coming together and saying that they want to set up the startup bill is a good step. Um, the most important thing, I think, is inclusion. And the fact that they're, they're preparing this bill or developing this bill in collaboration with the ecosystem, with key stakeholders, um, helping to develop, helping to raise awareness and engaging on this bill, I think is it's super important. And if we just think about other countries, other African countries that have done similar initiatives, from Senegal to Kenya to Ethiopia, um, and another country that, that I, I can't remember right now, um, the outcome was good. It helped their ecosystem. It helped to develop their ecosystem. It helped people invest in their ecosystem. It gave entrepreneurs um, sort of like the, the, the assurance and encouragement to be able to start new businesses and also the backing from, from regulators as well. Mm. Samuel, let me get your view. Are you on the same platform with uh, Tosi? Uh, that you did not know that there was an investment and in startup policy earlier? Okay, so um, yes. Um, even in preparation for this interview, I still went online to search for this policy and I couldn't find it. Um, and that says a lot about the policy, which is uh, a policy which is geared at the digital economy cannot be found online. So um, the startup bill, I would say is uh, an excellent bill. Um, I, I like, I particularly like the approach that was taken in forming that bill, a bottom-up approach um, that is engaging everyone within the ecosystem, um, not just some people sitting in Abuja, for example, coming up with a bill that they think will work for startups. Now, um, as much as I would commend everyone, so the volunteers to the government as well for this bill, um, I would say there's still a long way to go. We have to get it passed by the National Assembly. Um, mm -hmm. We have to build some other frameworks around this bill. And then implementation. Um, I, I would say one thing I've heard uh, when talking about this bill to people is everything dies during implementation in Nigeria. And um, we're definitely looking forward to seeing this being implemented. As Tosin mentioned, Nigeria did or we raised over 1.5 million a billion dollars, sorry, last year, um, and this is out of about four billion raised in Africa by technology startups. Now, this is without, or should I say, minimal support from either the regulators or the government. Now, imagine what would happen when um, things are working together for the good of startups, entrepreneurs. Um, regulators are also able to have the tools to do whatever they need to do 
But you know, it, it, I imagine that this will scale up probably 10x within the next five years. It already did 5x within um, the last five. So it, it's just going to be an exponential growth. So it, it is a welcome development. Um, and we we'll definitely want to see it get to implementation. You know, um, Samuel, let me stick with you a bit before going back to Tosin. And taking from what you and Tosi said, in fact, talking about the amount of money that came into the country uh, last year alone, uh, startup financing, about 1.7, in fact, it's $1.7 billion uh, last year, trailing uh, behind some other countries. And I think Nigeria is the third uh, leading country in Africa, after South Africa and, uh, is it Kenya? I guess, in terms of uh, the, the ranking. Now, if you take a look at that, these businesses, these startups, did all this on their own, so to speak, without really no government support. Uh, you know, what challenges do you think that startups in Nigeria really face, and what, and how should this startup bill address that? Okay, so um, as much as we're talking about startups, yeah. These startups are new companies, in most cases, disrupting old industries. Now, um, being online or uh, being a technology startup, in most cases, would not prevent the challenges that have faced those old industries from also happening to you. So if I take, for example, Remedial Health, which is my company, um, we're digitizing the pharmaceutical supply chain in Africa. So think it do matter, yeah? Um, pharmacies have to go into these places to buy products um, for their pharmacies. And if you take into consideration the time they waste going there, if you take into consideration counterfeits, we're helping to solve all of that using technology. So they can just order um, on a mobile app or a mobile web app, um, and we deliver to their pharmacy within 24 hours. Now, as much as there's technology in there, we still have issues around one, logistics. Um, for us to be able to deliver on our promise of 24 hours delivery to pharmacies and chemists and hospitals, we pretty much have to build our own logistics infrastructure. Yeah, so that is an example of a challenge that um, we face. If I take another industry, for example, fintechs, um, bulk of our funding we're mostly for our fintech startups, right? And, and, and we have some really innovative entrepreneurs in that sector. The major problem they faced is with regulations. Mm -hmm. Which regulator do you talk to? You have regulators that have overlapping um, policies and oversight. So um, if, to give an example, sometime last year, or was it 2020 now, um, some apps were pretty much shut down abruptly, if I should use that word, yeah? And it was without warning. Now, I understand from the side of regulators their need to protect consumers. But you see, it can always be done with a human face. It can always be done with the consideration that um, investors are looking at this market, founders are going into this market. Are we destroying confidence? And, and frankly, that is what happened when, when those apps were shut down. Yes, so I'm saying if a little bit of engagement with those companies would have gone a long way in, in, in ensuring that um, uh, confidence remained, we can also use the Twitter ban as an example of that as well. Destroying confidence, uh, uh, investor confidence in the country, invest, destroying uh, founder confidence in building startups in Nigeria. Mm. All right, Tosi, let me bring you in at, at, at this time. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been looking at what the government is proposing concerning the startup bill, and I'm looking at how it would enable, what kind of frameworks should the government put in place uh, to enable the innovation ecosystem thrive more than it is striving uh, right now. From, from your own point of view, because this is your job daily, uh, you interact, interact with more of these entrepreneurs every, every day than I do. 
Um, what kind of regulatory framework do you think that the government should have in mind, especially as the bill, or especially as the National Assembly will be considering that? I do hope that the House or the National Assembly, rather, would have a lot of information and would engage with a lot of you in that space to create the kind of enabling environment for it to work. Absolutely, Nancy. Um, I think the first thing the bill should do is actually label companies. Um, I think the bill should differentiate between startups and scale-ups because mm. different categories have different challenges and you should be able to address those challenges um, individually. If I start with startups, for instance, there's challenges around infrastructure. Entrepreneurs that are just starting have need access to power and they need access to internet, fast internet. These things are expensive for an entrepreneur that's not making money yet. So the bill should address if should have a framework around infrastructure for early stage businesses. Um, another challenge is talent. There's so many people interested in tech talent. And I found out we, we did a lot of work um, in Lagos State while I was at the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. And they can't afford the training. So the bill should actually en enable some sort of capacity um, capacity building for people interested in tech in, in, for, for early stage companies. Um, and then another challenge is capital. Now we did say that yes, Nigeria, Nigerian startup companies or scale up companies rather raised $1.7 billion. The truth is a lot of that money was raised by growth stage companies. And so if an entrepreneur is just starting out, it's sometimes difficult for them to have access to early stage funding. And so that's where this bill can help with a grant or loan or some, some sort of access to financing for early stage companies. And then if we then move to scale ups and think about their challenges, scale ups need access to market. You know, a, a fantastic example would be um, if the bill can come up with a public procurement preference for, for tech startups. So if the public, if the government is going to give any contract or, or, or procurement, there's, there's a small set aside for, for scale-ups and even for startups as well. So I think it's important that we label the categories of, of, of companies and their life cycles, and then... Um, think about the challenges in each life cycle, and then have um, solutions to address those challenges. So see, I like that you brought that up, that there should be a difference between startups and, and scale-ups, uh, uh, really, because yeah. for you to get to a scale-up level, at least you st you've passed the startup stage, as it were. Uh, at least uh, the scale-up is like the senior brother or senior sister of, star of startup, as it were. But also in the ecosystem, I know that for startups, they do consider themselves different from small businesses or micro businesses. Mm -hmm. what, yes. Why, why do you think it is so? Uh, because if we're talking about startups, I also do need to uh, put that caveat or say the difference. We know that there are startups in different areas of, or different sectors or different businesses that are being tech enabled. So we have like the tech tech asset where we could also have agricultural business or agri-tech, ed-tech, and whatever you, you, you have, but technology enables those, those businesses. So at the end of the day, uh, why is it that startups think that they are different from small businesses? Startups are, startups are different from small businesses. Um, startups are tech, like you, like you just rightly said, um, tech-enabled businesses. So they have tech-enabled products, they have tech-enabled solutions, or tech-enabled um, a small business might, most times do not. And um, when you think about small businesses, you think about micro businesses, you think about mom and pop shops, for instance, mom and pop businesses with very simple business models. Um, you think about a, 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 a business with, with one or two people, one or two employees. When you think about small and medium businesses, you think about businesses with maybe um, 10 to a maximum of 50 employees. When you think about a startup, you think about a company that has a, a product that has a potential to scale. And the only way that product is going to scale is through technology. Mm. Okay. Samuel, do you have anything to say concerning uh, that? So you, if we if we dovetail from what Tosin uh, has said, that means that 
perhaps the financing model for startups should also be different from what we see from other businesses. Like in the year 2020, we know that the CBN, for example, came up with different interventions, the TCF, Targeted Credit Facility, and uh, the COVID loans for businesses. From what Tosi has said now, does that mean that startups should have different financing models and different interventions? Yes, yes, you're correct, Nancy. So um, following on from what Tosin said, the, 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 dif the major difference, in my opinion, between uh, startups and small businesses is the power of the internet. Yeah, so um, if I set up a shop today in Ikeja, Lagos, where I'm based, um, maybe I can reach 100,000 customers a year, maybe. With the power of the internet, I can reach a million. So not just people in Ikeja or people who pass through Ikeja. I can reach people as far as Kano. I can reach people as far as Katsina. I can reach people as far as Potakot. That's the major difference. And um, with startups, they have the power, because of the power of the internet, they're able to scale exponentially, right? So uh, you typically see maybe a small business in terms of revenue growing maybe 5% year on year, 10% year on year. With startups, you're probably talking three, four hundred percent year on year, right? So that also leads back into the sort of funding that startups require. And we have this sort of funding already in Nigeria. It's just one, um, investor confidence is not so strong, one. Two, people are just getting comfortable with uh, angel investments. That is investing a small amount into um, companies in hope for a return, or maybe not, depending on if the business works out. So strong, one. Two, people are just getting comfortable with uh, angel investments. That is investing a small amount into um, companies in hope for a return, or maybe not, depending on if the business works out. Um, now, for the government, the interventions that were done last year, I would say they were very helpful. If I'm being honest, I haven't heard of anyone who got um, any of this funding, but that sort of funding would still apply to startups. What I would advocate for is the government putting in regulations, enabling environment, so basically making um, Nigeria more startup friendly so that investors are interested in putting in money into companies. There are already investors who want to do this, right? But again, the challenges of doing business in Nigeria, the challenges, um, and again, it's a new sector actually. So it, it, people are just getting comfortable with the, making those investments. If government steps out of the way, give these investors the confidence, um, they will do their part as well. And then the government can continue to do um, some of the interventions that it has done for small businesses, which startups, I imagine, will still take uh, uh, part in. Mm. Let me come back to you, Tosi, and take it from where uh, Samuel stopped in terms of the kind of funding that we should expect, as, uh, like a government seed, uh, a government-backed kind of a funding to enable startups to thrive and possibly grow. And when these startups grow, definitely they will employ more people. Uh, you know, they get bigger. We saw what happened with Paystack in 2020, even in the midst of the pandemic. That was one good news. Uh, we know that there are some companies now that have that unicorn status here in Nigeria, not because necessarily of what the government has really done, but because of the sheer commitment and dedication of this young uh, men and women. So what kind of government-backed seed funding are you looking at for startups, especially as the startup bill would be debated soon? Um, I will be very excited if they come up with a government seed funding for early stage startups. Um, I think it would even make more sense if it's a grant just because I don't think government should own businesses. I think the government's role is to be an enabler, um, not to be an equity partner. So I think it would make sense if it's actually a grant. Um, I think it would also, would also make sense if there's some sort of like 
there's intentional focus on women-led businesses because we've mm. come to find out that there's a huge gap, a huge financing gap, financing gap for female-owned businesses. So I think it's important that the government is intentional about funding early, super early stage female-owned businesses. And something that someone mentioned, um, true, you don't have to do it alone. I think the startup bill should include in its framework an incentive for angel investing, an incentive for corporate investors. It could be, and I don't know what it, what it would look like, to be honest. I'm not working on, on this bill with the team. Um, but something around, it could be tax exemptions. It could be something around exempting capital gains. I don't know what it would look like, but something to encourage investors, to encourage local investors, most especially. Um, and I also think something around encouraging corporate innovation. Now, um, yes, Samuel did mention that we're disrupting a lot of companies or startups are disrupting old companies. But the truth is a lot of these old companies have the data, they have the market and they have the customers to test and adopt some of these um, products that, that the startup guys are working on. So I think some sort of incentive around encouraging corporates to adopt technology, to adopt um, some of these products that our founders are coming up with and to test it um, would be super helpful if it's also included in the framework. Mm. If we take a look at, uh, Samuel, if we take a look at some of the things that we expect the startup uh, bill uh, to address, it may uh, lead to, I was, uh, I, I saw that it will lead to subsidized local data facilities. Of course, this is backed by technology, uh, data expenses, or data cost in Nigeria. It's still quite huge compared to some other uh, countries. If you also take a look at what the startup bill is expected uh, to uh, get through with tech packs. How do you guys feel about this? <laughs> tech packs, have it in mind that uh, the, the financial system is also uh, putting together an international financial center, so to speak. So are we going to be expecting like an international tech center for those of you in that ecosystem? Just uh, perhaps is it a bigger version of Yaba oh. or a more organized version of Yaba? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what you just mentioned is actually captured in the bill. Um, the government plans, or at least what is um, currently captured in that bill states that tech pass, packs will be established around the country, one, to provide electricity for these entrepreneurs to work, two, to provide subsidi subsidized data or free data for these um, entrepreneurs to work. Now, um, that is a welcome development. And the reason I say that is I have been in the tech ecosystem in Nigeria for coming on a decade if not more than a decade since i was probably age 17 18 and i've seen our progression over the years um from when getting a sim card was um, the big thing in town um to now where you have multiple options multiple data plans i would say it still goes back to government providing an enabling environment where you have more um, competition prices will drop. If we can have, for example, more uh, mobile networks, we can have more data providers. I expect that data would drop considerably. To give you an example, um, in setting up our office in 2013, we were paying on average about 500,000 Naira per month for data. Right now, for even a hundred times better um, internet plan, we're paying probably 60, 70,000 Naira. Now, that is the difference over a couple of years. Without, um, I would say, without government really doing anything to drive down those prices. Um, now, again, uh, an example would be back in, 2019, in 2013, we didn't have, I would say, angel investors that were geared towards tech as much as we do now we didn't have accelerators and incubators. Um, I would mention Ventures Platform. Um, they were one of the first uh, incubators in Nigeria. 
And I could see how the tech ecosystem really progressed from um, setting up of that incubator slash accelerator. Because when you give people that environment to say, okay, you know what, come in, free electricity, come in, free data, um, feel free to build. Even if you fail, try again. Mm -hmm. You would get a lot of innovative companies coming out of Nigeria. Okay. Uh Tosin, as we come to the end of the program, and I'll see if I can also put this in because we're also getting comments on Twitter. But Tosin, talk me through how you think that this startup bill uh, will be a game changer perhaps in the next few years if we are able to implement this in terms of revenue uh, generation. And Samuel, I know you're still uh, listening to me. Take this uh, comment on Twitter from Achijo uh, Kekalu to uh, his Twitter name is Kwashoko. So I, I don't want to say that. Let me read what I saw his name, Chijoke Kalutu. He said, how do you legislate startup in an uncertain internet age? So Samuel, that question will be for you. Tosi, speak to me about how you think this will change revenue generation if we get the financing right, as you have said earlier, and the enabling environment right. How do you think that this will change revenue generation? Perhaps FIRS and uh, state IRS, IRSs will be chasing all of you. <laughs> for money. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I like what you said, if we get implementation right, I'll just, and execution, mm. which is super important. Um, I think, you know, like, based on what we've been, we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, even with how bad things were in 2021, our startups raised, our, our tech ecosystem raised $1.7 billion. That tells you something. Um, we have more than one unicorn in our ecosystem. And so if we, if we think about the bill creating this enabling environment, if it actually happens, we can 5X, 10X that number, 20X that number, because we have, we have the talent. Our founders are resilient. Our founders understand our unique problem and they're working every day Okay. to solve that unique problem okay. and so if they have the right environment and the regulators understand what they're trying to do and understand that we do have this the common goal of job creation wealth creation and overall prosperity that would automatically mean revenue generation okay because as the founders sell make money scale um they're paying taxes here they're paying taxes at okay. the end of the day Okay, so Tosin. yes, Nancy, like you said, mm. FIRS would be happy or LIRS or whatever state it is mm. that they're paying their that where they're paying their taxes to. Okay. And so and, and and even beyond revenue generation, I think the most important thing is unemployment. Unemployment, unemployment is yes. high yes. in Job Nigeria. Creation. I don't think we realize yeah. how high it is. Mm. And okay. we have so Okay. Um Samuel, take the other question and we've got to go now. How do you legislate internet? Uh, how do you legislate startup in an uncertain internet age? Do we still have Samuel there? Okay, okay. I think I think uh, we've run out of time. Um, I want to say thank you to you both. Can I see you both? Thank you, Tosi, and thank you, Samuel. Uh, let's hope we'll do this sometime soon uh, because the startup bill is still being proposed, and let's see how the debates will run at the National Assembly and we'll be here again to talk about that. So thank you very much to you both uh, for joining me today. I've been speaking with uh, Tosin Fanyo Dada, who is the Chief Executive at uh, Endeavor and Samuel Lokwada, co-founder at the Media Health. So thank you both. That's the much you can take on today's edition of the program. It's Moneyline with me, Nancy. I'll see you tomorrow. Be the best you can be. I'm going to change that you want to see by for now.